Hello, thanks for joining us for Talking Europe on France 24. Now, the past few days have delivered ever more news of atrocities committed by the Russian military in Ukraine, including women and girls raped, civilians locked up, shot, reports of chemical weapons being deployed in the east of the country. Calls are continuing for more to be done to stop Russian President Vladimir Putin. Here in the European Union, leaders have condemned the Kremlin, decrying the attacks as war crimes. On how to stop them happening, though, opinions are divided. Should EU states sanction Russian oil and gas worth billions to Moscow each week? Or could this end up causing more economic harm to Europeans than Russians amid a cost of living spike. I'm joined today by two members of the European Parliament. We have with us Hena Verkunen, who's a Finnish member of the European Parliament and member of the European People's Party, and in Germany, Helmut Scholz, a member of the left group. Thank you very much to both of you for being with us. Hello. Hello. So I'd like to come to you first, Hena Verkunen. We know that uh, Poland and Lithuania's governments are among those who are leading the calls for a ban on Russian oil and gas. Uh, do you agree with them? Yes, I do. I think all the European member states, European Union member states, they should stop buying energy from Russia. So I was very disappointed that we have now decision only about coal. I think we should buy also oil and gas from Russia. Because, like you said, we are all the time supporting uh, Putin's war when we are buying energy from Russia. OK, so let's get a response from uh, Helmut Scholz. Um, we are in favour, of course, of targeted sanctions as well, because we need a immediate stop of this war. The problem is, do we are reconsidering in which way we the sanctions, gas, oil and coal, will really contribute to finish this war. And the problem is that uh, with the gas cutting down at, at all it immediately will, I think, uh, harm um, not only uh, our industries and our way of uh, life, but also that of uh, Ukrainian people, of uh, people in other Central and Eastern European countries, as well as the Russian Federation. So we have to, to re the way how we are organizing our energy production today and tomorrow. Helmut Schultz, returning to you, uh, what measures would you suggest or support in that case? Um, frankly speaking, as I have a Finnish colleague, I would immediately call for a conference of security and cooperation in Europe zero at uh, 2.0, as we had it in Helsinki 1973, because we are uh, facing a, a, a complexity of problems and questions which are linked to the war and the aggression of Putin against Ukraine. And we have to find a way how to put the problems we are really st facing with uh, have to be uh, discussed together, because uh, only concentrating on sanctions or of delivering of weapons will not solve the problem immediately. And so I think we need a return to the political table and we need to discuss and all the complexity, security issues, economic issues, energy issues, environmental aspects, as well as cultural aspects. And here I think that is the, uh, the point who are or who could be the structure to organize such a thing because we have a deep loss of trust and maybe nobody is trusting anymore in Putin. Uh, but we have, to, of course, to face the, the challenge that we have to find a political solution to stop the war. Hena Virkin, in your response then to Mr. Scholz's suggestions. I think that this war must be stopped. And the way how we can stop it is that we are putting full sanctions and implementing them. And it means that we shouldn't buy Russian energy anymore. And also all the banks, Russian banks, they should be excluded from SWIFT system. So that is what I'm demanding. And we, we have seen what Russians can do. They have been attacking a sovereign country. And we have seen all this brutal war, what they are having there. We have seen all these war crimes. So I think we have to now take all the efforts, what we can, from the European side mm. to stop the war. And we have to also support Ukrainians, because we know that Ukraine is not only fighting for their own freedom, they are also fighting for democracy and all the European values. So they need all our support.
Um, Henna Verkunen, if I can stay with you, uh, we want to talk as well about the impact of sanctions on Europeans. This is something that has been mentioned, uh, for example, by the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Uh, we saw the oil price soar to a 14-year high in March. Ordinary Europeans feeling the cost when they buy petrol, when they buy food. Are we asking too much? I think living here in Finland, where we have 1,300 kilometer border with Russia, the people in Finland, they understand very well that it will have also impacts to us when Russia is attacking to Ukraine. So we can't totally avoid that the uh, prices are not rising in Finland, for example. But uh, when the people see how much the Ukrainian people, citizens are suffering, they understand that there is also a price we have to pay. Of course, it's a big, big problem for Europe that European Union and many member states, they have been so dependent on Russian energy for years. Mm. In the same time, when we have been all the time speaking about it, that we have to invest to our own clean energy sources, to renewables and also to nuclear power in, in Europe to, to make sure that we are not so dependent on Russian energy. Mm. But we can see that all the member states, they haven't been so successful in this policy. Helmut Schultz, do you see this argument that the move away from Russian gas can or will accelerate Europe's transition to green energy sources? Cynically, I could say Putin's war is pressuring the European Union to, to accelerate the transition. But we have uh, in the European Union discussed how very, very, how to say, deeply and, and for a long time how we make it a just transition. And in the just transition, we have the social impact. And the social impact of the just transition is that we have to find addresses how to produce energy on the basis of renewables. And in Germany, we have discussed uh, that the nuclear power is not an alternative. It's not a, a green, how to say it, energy source, because nobody in Germany wants to have the waste under his house, in his village, or in the region. So the problem is we can't export the nuclear waste into other regions of the world. That is um, also not not honest and not not a, the best way. So this is a question we have to, to, mm. to rely on our own discussions. And mm. um, if you're speaking about the cost and the impact of the question, um, I understand the Finnish situation, but we have also to understand the situation in France, Spain, Poland or Germany where we have in Germany 80 million people. And uh, if I see who is paying the price, it's the common people. It's uh, th those who are affected by this transition period. And so for, we need a much more subsidized approach to accompany the, the ways of the transition on the one side mm. and the impact of the war on the energy uh, supplies um, uh, on the other side. And here I think the complexity of the question needs really to sit together. And finally, um, the, the transition is needed in the Russian Federation as well. So I don't want to have a melting a tundra and the, and the, and the, um, the permafrost soil uh, wasted because that will um, emit a lot of methane, tons of methane, tons of CO2, not comparable with the today's CO2 emissions. And the IPCC just told us that we have remaining two years to stop the warming about 1.5 rate in the, in the next century. To reach this goal, we need to act and to handle it the next, within the next two years. So I hope that we are not replacing the Russian gas by fracking gas from the United States or by gas from Algeria mm -hmm. or Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. oil uh, as such. So, so we have to, to discuss these questions together. And that's why I think we have to sit on the table and we have to, to see what are the solutions. OK, we'll have to end our discussion there, but um, I'm sure those uh, environmental aspects are something we can discuss another time. Thank you both for being with us on the programme. Henna Verkunen and Helmut Scholz, thank you. Thank you. Now, before we end our programme, we wanted to give you a closer look into some of the less reported ways that the cost of living crunch is impacting and some proposals to help alleviate pressure on ordinary people. Last June, the European Parliament called for menstrual hygiene products to be given a value-added tax or VAT exemption. Our correspondent in Brussels has been to meet a charity that's calling for these products to be provided 100% cost-free. 
At this day center close to the main train station in Brussels, these homeless women come to seek a little comfort. Here, Marie is well known to the staff. At 37, she's already spent more than half her life on the streets. Hi, Margot. I'd like a hygiene kit, please. This hygiene kit is particularly valuable for the young homeless. Once a month, she finds herself faced with the same problem, the impossibility of buying sanitary protection. Well, once a month, for a week, it's a bit miserable and we lose a lot of blood. The needs are important because it's something that's still very, very expensive, and it happens monthly, and we can't do anything about it. The center is provided for by this association, which collects menstrual products to distribute to women in difficulty. Last year, more than 650,000 were collected. Five years ago, while trying to help a woman on the street, Veronica Martinez found herself confronted for the first time with menstrual poverty. Visibly in distress, a woman chose to ask her for a tampon rather than for food. Since then, the director of the association has been trying to bring awareness to this subject. To lift the taboo, we have workshops. And we also go to schools to talk about the taboo around periods. At the political level, well, these are always political choices. It's a political will to allow free menstrual products for all women, like in Scotland or New Zealand. Veronica Martinez welcomes the drop in VAT in Belgium on sanitary protection. Last June, the European Parliament passed a resolution asking for these products to be VAT exempt everywhere in the EU. Well, that's it for Talking Europe this week. Thank you very much for being with us and see you soon here on France 24.